You've heard of distracted driving. I'm going to talk about a more consequential kind of distraction, one that can bring down airliners. So, when we hear the phrase, too much information, this is what we normally think of. It's a slang expression. It's basically what you tell your friend when they are right on the verge of disgusting you. <laughs> too much information. And it's very effective. But there's another version of too much information which coexists with the slang form. And it's the too much information that comes from our digital lifestyles, uh, comes from the fact that we're drinking from the water hose of the net, and the fact that you walk around a cocktail party these days and everybody has one of these out, and uh, rather than actually talking to one another, is actually staring down at their, uh, their smartphone. <clears throat> you know, and too much information actually um, can exist in an ecosystem that can be totally unintended. Um, so, have you ever heard this around your house or apartment? Beep, beep, and maybe it's coming from this, or this, or this, or this, and you wander around from device to device going like this, trying to understand what's going on. And you know, to each of those product engineers, there was brilliance in making a beep to let you know that the fridge door was open. But in an ecosystem of smart devices, those beeps drive you in insane, all right? When you're driving at 60 miles an hour, um, talking to your boss, trying not to spill coffee on your shirt, you're dealing with too much information. We call it distracted driving, but it's really driving under data overload. Our big brains just can't handle it. Supposedly, there's a, a robot called Siri in this device, and she can help our big brains out. Hmm. So here's a big brain. It's a mouse brain. Steve Smith at Stanford imaged every single synapse in a minute part of this mouse brain. Those red dots, they're synapses. They're, they are the atoms of neuronal computation in our brain. Our brain has 10 to the 15th of those. That's 10 with 15 zeros in front of it. Each of our brains, each of our brains in this audience are the most complex machine we know of in the universe. So why do our big brains have any problems? It's because our brains are evolved. They're not engineered, all right? They have some bugs, but they also have some features. One of our bugs is that we're not excellent at handling too much information at once. I'm gonna talk about three stories uh, of airplane pilots dealing with too much information. The first, Air France 447 ended tragically with the loss of all souls. The second, Qantas Flight 32 was saved only because of the luck of having uh, some extra brains around. The third, the miracle on the Hudson was just that, a miracle. All of these instances had some component of too much information intersecting with human brains. <clears throat> on June 1st, 2009, Air France 447 taxied to the takeoff position at Rio de Janeiro's Galeo Airport, ready for its nonstop routine flight to Paris Charles de Gaulle Airport. On board were 216 passengers and 12 crew members, you're looking at the actual aircraft. It was modern, well-maintained, and crewed by employees of France's national flag carrier. In short, there should have been no problems. <clears throat> there were reports of a mesoscale convective system along the path of the flight, with thunderstorm clouds extending to 50,000 feet above the flight ceiling for a normal commercial jet. Analysis of the flight conditions from satellite data show that flight 447 spent its last 12 minutes at the center of the system. But that shouldn't have knocked the plane out of the sky. <clears throat> Shortly after 2 in the morning local time, after the experienced captain had left the cockpit to take a routine rest, the second officer and the relief pilot would have seen this instrumentation panel, glass cockpit, as the jet entered the storm. Note, this is a highly automated cockpit. It's flight fly-by-wire. Computers can control this entire aircraft. Unfortunately, those computers started to deliver messages like these that you may have seen on your own computer screens at some time. 
what happened was the jet's airspeed indicators, those are called pitot tubes, were sending conflicting readings to the aircraft's computers. Here's a pitot tube right here. Air coming in gives the airplane speed. When you're traveling at nearly the speed of sound, about 600 miles per hour, you have about a 20 mile per hour narrow window between flying too fast such that you break apart and flying too slow such that you fall out of the sky. As those computers started delivering error messages, the pilots had to make a rapid decision. And these were, this was not the captain, these were the, the reserve pilots. They decide rapidly without appropriate instrumentation were they going too fast or too slow. They made the wrong decision. They decided that they were going too fast and so they pulled back on the stick and the plane went into a stall fully operational, all engines running, and fell 35,000 feet in a matter of minutes. We know this because after two years we found the plane's black boxes on the bottom of the South Atlantic Ocean. In short, these pilots were overwhelmed by an enormous amount of information with very little time to react. The story of Qantas Flight 32 has a happier ending. On November 4th, 2010, this plane left Singapore, Singapore's Changi Airport en route for Sydney. She had 440 passengers on board and a crew of 29. About 45 minutes into the flight, out over Batam Island, Indonesia, there was a loud bang, and this is what passengers on the port side of the plane actually saw outside their window. The large hole in the top of the wing is, of course, obvious. What you may not notice is this circle. That's fuel jetting out of the fuel tank uh, under unbelievably high pressure. The number two engine on that plane had disintegrated. It was an uncontained explosion, and the shrapnel from that explosion hit these various parts of the Airbus 380. Here's a picture of the inside of the wing, and uh, you can see the projectile path. The projectiles from the disintegrating engine cut off the main hydraulic lines, the reserve hydraulic lines. They went through the fuel tank, and they did structural damage to the wing. Just to see a picture up close of the wing after the plane landed, that's one big hole in that wing, and that was just one of many holes. In short, this plane was in desperate trouble. The plane was highly damaged, and its computer systems were busy spitting out <laughs> error messages to the pilots. Hundreds and hundreds of error messages. In fact, those pilots spent the next 90 minutes not figuring out what was wrong with the plane, but figuring out actually what still worked on the plane. Out of some 29 gas tanks on that plane, there were three working left. All right? The plane was, in contrast to Air France 447, in far worse shape. The lucky aspect of this flight is you can count them. By chance, there were five pilots on that plane. If you look at their, their uh, epaulets, four of them were full rank captains for the airline. And the reason that plane landed successfully is because they split up the cognitive load. It was a lucky flight. And so they figured out how to configure the landing in Singapore after about 90 minutes. The plane took the entire length of the Singapore runway. Um, there was only battery power left when they finished up landing, and they had to communicate with the firefighters using a walkie-talkie. Otherwise, the plane had nothing left. By the way, the plane is now back in surface at a repair cost of $140 million. It's sort of like almost being totaled, but not quite. It's the worst kind of car accident you can have. I know that from personal experience. And of course, this is a story we all know pretty well. The story of Captain Sully Sullenberger and the Miracle on the Hudson, the plane took off on January 15, 2009 from New York's LaGuardia Airport, hit birds on takeoff and lost all thrust from the engines, it landed in the Hudson. So uh, what's unique about this episode is that the pilot was a glider pilot uh, as an avocation, as a hobby, and the other aspect is 
He stopped communicating with air traffic control, his co-pilot, the passengers, and he did only one thing, one zen thing. He focused on landing that plane perfectly in the Hudson like a glider without any engines. He was so focused on landing this plane perfectly in the Hudson that he neglected to even go through the checklist for ditching a plane in the water, and he left the valves open on the outside of the plane that normally you're supposed to shut to stop the plane from sinking in the water. What he did do was put that, pl that plane down perfectly. He used the tail, actually, to break the plane, to slow it down, and then put the nose down very gracefully. And of course, everybody survived. He had the sense of mind to become undistracted. <laughs> so the lessons from these three incidents, don't get overwhelmed. Split up the work if you can, and block out everything except what you have to succeed at. Thank you very much.